compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. This is how the story goes. One of the smallest countries in the world, it takes just about an hour to get around the city-state. The Vatican is perhaps the only state that doesn't check your passport when you cross at the border. Here the images of the past haunt like dim shadows. There used to be a small monastery located on the site of what's now the Cathedral of St. Peter. Father John used to come here for an evening sermon. Picture an image of the bishop taking heavy steps towards the monastery. Here his coat's hem rustle. He's just arrived from his long and exhausting travel through the dry lands of the Caspian region and snowy peaks of the Altai Mountains. This is how the story goes. The Roman Pope on behalf of the Christian world was looking for allies among the Mongols. We have some, even though scattered, information about those times in Central Asia from the manuscripts of those ambassadors. On the one hand, much of the Vatican archives are becoming available, but on the other hand, much is still left unknown. Chapter 1. Galloping through the steps. Travelling on a camel is actually quite a pleasant experience, as long as you're not travelling for months. Camels had to bear all the hardships of the ancient voyages. Father John also had to sacrifice his comfort. The messengers of the Pope were left with little time before the big event, the election of the new Khan. So the messengers travelled on horses. You have to believe in all we are writing to you, as we've seen it with our own eyes. While wandering with them a little over a year and four months, and after having lived in their environment, after all, we were instructed by the Supreme High Priest to survey and examine carefully in every detail. The expedition led by the Papal Legate John del Plano Capini began its journey in April 1245. Starting from France, the travellers soon reached Sarai, Batu Khan's residence. However, the grandson of Genghis Khan sent the delegation to his superiors in Mongolia, so this is how the Europeans set foot on the Great Steps for the first time. This is the medieval settlement of Sarashik. The city was built as a small palace of the Golden Horde. Batu Khan's palace was located right in the heart of the Golden Horde. The ruins of the palace are kept in the Russian Federation. The delegation sent to Mongolia had become smaller since Batu Khan kept two of the European messengers in his residence, which back then was at the height of its glory. The founder of the city was Batu. The Silk Road passed through the city, and that's why they built a bridge here. Sarayshik quickly turned into a large trade center. However, what type of city landscapes Brother John and his companions saw here is hard thing to guess. Plano Carpini devoted a chapter to the route they were taking, and most of his descriptions were about the hardships and horrors of the trip. Carpini wrote that they saw the remains of human bones scattered like litter on the ground. Just like the Comans and the Kangites do not cultivate the land, they breed cattle. They do not build houses but live in tents. They were also destroyed by the Tatars on their own land, and those who remained were turned into slaves. The delegation crossed the Ural River and reached the desert, where the head of the mission had a particularly hard time. The monk was in his 60s. In addition, his contemporaries described him as an overweight man who used to ride donkeys instead of a horse. The papal legate had to ride horses during the expedition. Sometimes he had to change up to seven horses per day. Luckily, the nomadic infrastructure allowed him to do so. Every 30 kilometers of the route, there were caravanserai, or cities. Full 
Şerifin saraylardan, kalalardan biri, kader buna bizler körüp duran müşteride kızılgala. Arkeologların ayıtı boyunca... One of the caravanserais was Kizil Kala, located right here. According to archaeologists, the city was a vibrant settlement during the 9th and 14th centuries. Many say the city occupied a large territory. Some of the routes of the Great Silk Road passed through the city. Chapter 2. Remarkable coincidences. Carpini visited Kizil Kala at the time of its decline. According to archaeological data, the city ceased to flourish and started to decline at the end of the 13th century. The remains of the old ramparts and red brick foundations are the only living witnesses of the bygone glory of Kizil Kala. One of the most legendary places of the Manjistau Peninsula is the Shirkala Mount, which used to hold the Red City in its foothills. The so-called Lion Mountain, according to old legends, served as an impregnable fortress for the city. One legend says that the defensive side of the battle, I don't know whether they were Turkmen or Kazakh, but they hid in the mountain by closing its entrance. The way up the mountain is on the other side, so they survived for many months, maybe years, by digging a deep well in the mountain and staying in it to protect themselves from the invaders. The fortress was taken anyway, and the well was destroyed. However, as the legend goes, the brave defenders were able to escape and were never found. Numerous shelters of the cave were able to rescue them. Caves, tunnels and mosques hold many mysteries. Perhaps it's these legends that Plano Carpini once took notes of. Genghis Khan went to the campaign against the East through the lands of the Kyrgyz, whom he couldn't defeat in a battle, and as we were told, he took the route through the Caspian Mountains. His troops couldn't find a single person. They sought for people so strenuously that they finally found the man and the wife. When Genghis Khan asked them where the people of these lands were, they replied that they lived in the ground, under the mountains. Indirectly, the story can be confirmed by the sound effects produced here during the strong winds. According to the records of the papal legate, the howling winds produced such a strong noise that even the strongest warriors of Genghis Khan could only withstand it by kneeling to the ground and covering their ears. The locals, of course, took advantage of nature's peculiarities in their war tactics. The people of the Caspian region were, in general, notorious for using the noise tactics during battles against foreign invaders, the enemies. According to another hypothesis, Carpini described the impressions of the people of the Singing Sands. The traveller could have learned about these legends during his further trip along the Ili River. In hot weather, the temperature heats the sand. The sand starts vibrating and producing a sound resembling a jet engine's hum. The vibration spreads within a radius of 100 meters, so the hum can be heard in this range. A coincidence. One of the local myths tells of an underground city hidden under the singing dunes of Altin Amel National Park. Local people say the sands sing when the soul of Genghis Khan, exhausted from anguish, tells his descendants about his deeds. Supposedly the founder of the Mongol Empire was buried somewhere here. The peculiarities of the singing dunes are unique and are unlike other sands. It's hard to imagine how one can live underground or build an underground city in these dunes. Some scientists believe that Carpini was referring to the Caucasian mountains in his manuscripts. Indeed, Father John was very vague in his geographical descriptions. However, the papal legate was exceptionally precise and thorough when describing the combat strategies of the local nomads. Chapter 3. Battle Brother. Did this shape denote anything? 
This is the symbol of a fish. Fish was a mysterious creature for the people of the steppe. Even Genghis Khan worshipped fish. When Genghis Khan wanted to conquer a state or seize a city, he would send a messenger there with a dead fish as an offer to the local ruler to give up the city without a fight. Carpini devoted three chapters of his manuscript to the description of the stratagems of the Mongols. This is a strange fact considering that the main purpose of sending the delegation according to the Roman Pope's letter was to offer the new Khan to embrace the Christian faith. However, the mission was not even equipped with rich gifts in support of cooperation, as usually happened in similar cases. The expedition of Plano Carpini had a lot of strange facts, raising a lot of questions based on his later published manuscript. Every time they see an enemy, they attack by shooting three or four arrows at their opponents. And if they see that they cannot beat them, then they reverse back to their troops. And this they do for the sake of deception, so that the enemies chase them until those places where they have set up an ambush. The good-natured monk, characterized so by his brothers in faith, carefully described the subtleties of how the troops crossed rivers on inflatable leather rafts, the disposition of troops during battles, and the treatment of prisoners. He tells about how these fortresses were bypassed, how the archer Mongols and Uyghurs were armed, and he conscientiously recorded it all in detail. Plano was a scout. First of all, of course, he was a political figure, so he was sent to conclude, let's say, not to conclude, but to pursue reconnaissance. And this isn't surprising, just two years before the described events in 1243, Batu subdued and conquered all the countries located on the territory between the Baltic and the Adriatic Seas, including Hungary, Bulgaria and Poland. The Europeans were worried that they were faced with a new scourge of God that might bring an end to the old world, to Europe. The Mongol conquest of the West stopped because of a family matter. The Supreme Khan Ogadei died, and Batu Khan had to return home. That was why Plano Carpini was delegated to the Great Steppe. Three months later, after passing Otra, Jean Kent, and other cities, the delegation arrived in the main residence of the Tatars, the city of Karakurin. Epilogue, going down in history. The new Khan, Guyuk, sent a reply letter in which he proposed the Pope to personally express his humility because he, Guyuk, was the ruler of all the lands from those where the sun rises, ending with those where it sets. This was how Carpini's mission failed. However, the main historical value of his expedition was the fact that he recorded the Khan's inauguration, the lifestyle of the Central Asian nomads, their traditions and, most importantly, introduced the unexplored and mysterious nomadic steppes to the Europeans. History was being made at that moment. Where could it lead? Answering to this question was the most important task of Plano Carpini. The notes of Plano Carpini were incredibly popular. The first chapters of his manuscripts reached Europe even before he did. This is how he concluded his manuscript. We ask everyone who has read the above that they do not modify or add anything, as we, in truth, wrote all that we had seen or heard from others who were considered worthy of trust, without adding anything intentionally. God is the witness. Carpini himself was a witness to some of the greatest pages of history. Without knowing it, he himself went down in history.